we can begin the uh, final session of the day. And we have three speakers again, and then a final panel discussion. The first two speakers are both on the topic of um, robotics and automation. First at the surface, and the speaker is Dan Hook, um, now an independent consultant and starting a new venture called Armada, I understand. Yep. So over to you, please, Dan. Thanks, Chuck. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I'm going to sort of follow on a little bit from, from a topic that, that John Murray touched on this morning around surface automation, unmanned ships, unmanned surface vehicles, MAS, MASS. There's about 50 different names these things are going under, but I'll show you some examples and what I mean by that industry. So what I was going to talk about was give you a bit of an update on, on, on sort of my view of what's been happening in, in a very fast-moving industry. And, I'm going to start by sort of looking backwards, and not really to look at the, the rate of progress, more the sort of the change in that rate, the acceleration of the industry, and, and, and that sort of helps look forward as to what's likely to happen in the, the next few years. And the way I'm going to talk it is it's a sort of a crawl, walk, run and, and leap approach. So going back to sort of about 95 to 2005, really we're in sort of the pioneer phase of this. There were some products before that, don't, don't get me wrong, but really about 95 to 2005 is when most of the sort of unmanned surface vehicle industries we know it today, or the smart ship, autonomous ship industry, started to get going. And they, I like to still call these guys the, you know, the pioneers. We had a couple of projects running in the US looking at unmanned ribs that the Navy could use. Um, ISC in Canada with their Dolphin vehicles were one of the, the, the first into this space. And then a little company down in, in Chichester, which is, I was involved with, called ASV, um, making a thing called the SAS. Now, back in that sort of that, that sort of decade, we had lots of challenges with very lossy, slow radios, you know, lots of slow 232 modem mode radios, uh, poor range, poor quality. It, it was a challenge with radios. Um, even, even some of the defense kit that, that we could eventually get our hands on was very power hungry, got hot, it was difficult to integrate into to marine things. A lot of the effort just went into you know, actuating engines and gearboxes and steering and learning how to make those things reliable. Some pretty difficult to use, analog digital camera systems and, and pretty poor <coughs> interfaces to payloads. If we did fit systems like sonars or CTDs, it really all that we had at that sort of stage was basic ability to turn them on and off. Maybe change a few gains and variables but, but not really interact with them very much. Certainly no smart planning, live route analysis or anything like that. There was a good sort of mix of defence, science and commercial interest. Um, you know, of those pictures I've shown there, that, that's a pretty good mix actually of the three. So it was a fun place to be, very sort of pioneering, but, but hard to make sort of ends meet. It was very much reliant on, on R&D money from, from various organisations. Sort of the next decade, 2005-2015, the walk phase. So. Certainly a lot more maturity in the systems, things have become more reliable. There was really a much more of a, a big sort of software focus. So the decade before was getting communications links working, electromechanical systems, working out how to get things on and off of the boats, so on and so forth. This sort of decade, a lot of effort went into, into the software and you saw companies like Seabyte and others popping up really to offer software services and support products to this industry started to use more sort of software defined radios, IP radios, the amount of information we could transmit through the air was increasing, <coughs> started to test some of the satellite systems. You saw a lot more sort of vector based chart interfaces, we <coughs> factors guys started to, to help with the design of the systems as they started to go more operational. We could switch out a much wider range of payloads and, and it was beyond prototyping so in that sort of decade there were actually systems being delivered to contracts. Damages if they weren't delivered on time, and, and, and it, it became a real business. And, and you know, the number of companies involved in that decade was, was up into the sort of maybe 30, 40, 50 companies around the world that were doing various things. Um, we saw some early commercial use and some early defence use. The pictures I've picked there, that there could lots more I could have picked, but examples were on the defence side. You know, the Israelis were quite, quite, quite forward acting. You know, there were sort of protector vessels running around. Top right was a, was a project I was involved with, which was doing remote mine hunting. Bottom left, you've got some uh, sort of wave-powered systems we're getting out, like the, the liquid robotics wave glider there. At the bottom was another UK company, Atlas, with their Arkins, and, and bottom right was a commercial system. 
So there was more and more getting shipped. There was, there was maybe in that sort of period up to se several hundred probably at sea doing various things. Over the next sort of five years and, and up to today, what, what sort of happened within the industry is it has continued to grow. And there's now several hundred companies in the industry doing different things. It's it started to sort of branch. So we used to have events like this you know, for unmanned surface vehicles. Now it tends to be more you're into the sort of maybe long range ocean systems sector. You know, you've got a business in that area or you're an expert in that area. Examples of those being companies like the Sail Drone Guys, Alton Orp. Sailboy and, and other systems like the, the Sea and Jury. These tend to be energy harvesting, energy scavenging. In that, those pictures, there's an example of wind-driven ones, wave-driven ones, and, and solar electric-driven ones. So I think um, you, you'll, sort of, yeah, you, you'll see people are really focusing on that as a sector, and, and that's a space to watch, particularly when we're... They're, they're almost like satellites on the sea, because it's, it's a way of seeing those things, things that can go out for many months at a time. Um, fairly low power, but, but highly capable. The small inshore survey market's really growing. There's companies that now just do that. So these are the things that you can kind of fit in the back of a pickup truck. Two or three people can lift, move, launch. They're being used quite frequently now. You know, hazard a guess, right now there's probably 30 or 40 or 50 of those things somewhere in the world being used somewhere, either in a reservoir or a tailings pond or a top of a dam or wherever. Sort of small, short, close, close areas, daylight running, maybe running for three or four or five hours at a time when on a survey, and a few different examples of those. Then you've got the defence guys. Um, so there were quite a few companies that were in all three branches, science, defence and commercial. And it's, it's starting to change. You know, as, as industries mature and progress, you do get some consolidation and, and things happen. So these tend to be certainly at a much higher price point tend to be at a much higher power level. Speed is typically very important in, in the defence sector, so <coughs> you'll see you know, much higher horsepower per length um, or installed power per length in these systems. You know, you've got examples like the bottom left, active system is, is in the States. That, that was pretty big when it was launched. That was pretty impressive. That, that generated an awful lot of headlines. Um, over the next sort of two, two and a half years, you're going to see some things get launched in the States which make that look not so big. And there's some huge programs happening with very, very large unmanned surface vehicles. Go and look up MUSV and LUSV on, on the internet if you want to see some of that. And then sort of on the right, those are actually some, some UK projects funded by UK MOD. Um, things sort of around 10, 13, 14 metres long, blasting around doing some surveillance and security type roles. Um, some fantastic <coughs> capability in that, but, but fairly, fairly long projects, fairly sort of expensive projects but, but making some good headway. Then there's the companies and the people that are uh, focused on the sort of small and medium commercial systems. Um, three examples here, we've got Kongsberg with the, the sounder, C kit that was shown earlier at the bottom of the Max Liner and then an ASV C Worker 8. So these typically are, are going to see for a week, maybe two weeks, maybe three depending on speed and what they're doing. And deploying multi-beam sonars, USBLs for tracking things on the seabed. They're involved in sort of pipeline installations, maybe shallow water cable surveys, and a range of other things. So there's some sort of work around aquaculture and other happening. But that's a really active space. You're going to see a lot more systems like that sort of size going, going to market in the next year or two. And then there's the sort of area that, that John alluded to earlier, and certainly an area that grabs a lot of the headlines is and, and the public interest. The smart shipping, the autonomous ships, the big platforms. Again, I think uh, we saw we saw a list of sort of projects and it's been touched on in a few of the presentations today. A great example of this, if people want to sort of read around a good case study, is, is the Yara Birkeland project with, with, with Kongsberg. I recommend you go and read up on that. It's a great case study. But there are an increasing number coming, certainly from the Far East, as I mentioned in the States and big US Navy projects. So now you're starting to get conferences, events, blogs, news alerts in each of those sort of different sectors. It, it's matured, diversified and, and branched. So the next couple of years, and, and it, I, I talked about the sort of rate of acceleration. So I, I, I went straight into this industry from university, so I've nearly been in there 20 years. More has happened in the last two or three literally than the 17 before. And I mean by the number of vessels that have been launched, 
the number of companies that have come into the space, the number of payloads that have been integrated and missions that have been done, it's accelerating really, really fast. So normally when you sort of make a prediction about what's happening in the next couple of years, you're a little bit suspect, but I, I genuinely <coughs> do believe the pace it's happening um, is going to be quite an exciting couple of years. So we're certainly seeing a lot of new systems entering service. There's, there's a lot of things in build, in yards around the world that um, if you're involved in the project, you can go see, um, that <coughs> it's going to blow your mind and see if it hits the water. It, it's really impressive. So there are things in build coming into service. There's been a lot of trials, early projects, um, so many of them commercial, many of them contracts, many of them with uh, you know, downsides if the systems didn't work. But there are going to be increasing sort of situation where it's normal business in hydrographic survey. Um, John mentioned a job that we were involved with, with some years back off in the Bering Sea, you know, five five thousand seven hundred and something kilometres. That was a paying job, you know, the system had to work every day. It went back the next year and did more. Over the next two years you're going to see a lot more companies using these systems commercially and um, on paying work. There's a lot of defence systems going out, particularly in the mine hunting area, which are reaching their initial operating capability. So they've been in the hands of the developers, there's been sort of navy trials, test teams involved. They've been out in some pretty interesting theatres, but there's always been, you know, somebody from the, the company back at base just ready to help. They're actually going into the hands of sort of you know, operating users, frontline users, and, and doing work over the next few years. That's going to really drive up finding the problems, finding the faults, finding how to do things better. When you give it to a marine, you've got to make sure it works, otherwise it's coming back to let you know. Um, so the confidence in kind of core control and navigation <coughs> capabilities is going to take a big step forward in the next couple of years. John uh, mentioned the word sort of you know, trust and, and safety. And, that you're going to see that, that that be a big topic in the next few years as these things get used ever more. Regulation, operations, insurance. Um, there was quite an interesting meeting earlier this week um, with lots of lawyers, lots of insurers. Actually, people starting to genuinely make, make make money out of that now. There's quite a few unmanned vessels that are insurance policies are joining P and I clubs. There's quite a lot of lawyers that are, are booking time by the minute it feels sometimes, to, to giving advice, you know, writing operating procedures, writing legal documents for, for operators of these systems. Once the insurance and legal and, and, and finance people are into it, things <coughs> it, on the one hand feel like they're slowing down, but on the business hand, they are actually moving, moving through. It's good to have those people involved, believe it or not. So, the, the kind of where it gets really exciting, I guess, sort of, Going through this next few years, really building a lot of trust in the systems, getting a lot more out there. 2025 plus, it's, it's, it's time to leap, I guess. So I've made a few, a few sort of points here to talk through. So I think it's going to become a, an integrated part of the maritime industry. At the moment, we sort of talk about unmanned systems and sometimes it's the, the, the sort of geeky, weird guys in the corner. It's gradually becoming more mainstream. It's becoming more normal part of businesses. So I think it will become much more of an integrated part of the maritime <coughs> industry. There's going to be thousands of them at sea. So uh, we did a market study just over a year ago uh, as a business, and we identified about a thousand unmanned boats that have been used. Now, some of them were admittedly sort of fairly small university-sized systems. Some of them were 30, 40, 50 meter long projects. But give it a few more years, the rate that things are in build and going to be built, you're going to be into the several thousands by 2025. High resolution, high frequency data available from anywhere at affordable cost. Putting that comment up after seeing some of those satellite slides, <laughs> I'm, uh, it's kind of recalibrating my head a little bit after seeing some of those presentations that are fascinating. But when I put anywhere, just to give you a feel for, for sort of the confidence around that, um, you've got guys like Sail Drone running systems down in the Southern Ocean, down in the Antarctic, places that people said these things would never work they've been working for months. We've had systems up in the Bering Sea, right today they're off Azerbaijan, we've had them in the hop, we've had them running in sandstorms in, in, in the Middle East. There's some small ones running on highly acidic ponds you know, as, as outflows from, from, from power stations. There's even some running in you know, nuclear radioactive environments that the challenge of cleaning them off afterwards is interesting. But I literally do mean there's going to be unmanned boats of all sorts of different sizes available for jobs virtually anywhere. And 
again, calibrating, I, I had a, a chat with a, a, a scientist in the US that was working on unmanned surface vessels. And he said he wanted to show me a picture of his thing. It's not oh, great, I've seen lots, go and send it through to me. And <coughs> it was about that big. So some fascinating little projects with, with things in very small spaces. And that, that again, you have to recalibrate to think about. And support to a cleaner industry. Um, so this is becoming much, much, much more commercial. As you see more and more companies talking about offsetting carbon, carbon neutral. Investors looking at only putting their money into companies that can meet particular sort of sustainable emission reductions. Um, some of the oil companies now, you've got executives at those businesses that their, their personal bonuses, they're lucky to get them. Their personal bonuses are actually tied to demonstrating emission reductions in their business line. So they, they've got skin in the game to do it. So unmanned systems are going to have a big part to play in that in, in, in this time frame. So seabed survey, without doubt, it's already happening, it's going to happen more. Ocean science, it's, it's, it's a fascinating topic. I think everyone who works in all of these different unmanned boat industries, the ocean <coughs> science topic is the one that they all wish they could just spend all their time on. It is so fascinating. Transport. So Everything from fairly small packages, there's a couple of trial projects running where we're looking at getting spare parts out to engineers on, on wind turbines. So typical kind of scenario can be the engineer gets to the turbine, does his analysis and he finds that PLC block blah 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 is broken, he doesn't have one. So let's get back on the ship, go home, come back out the next day with that part. There is some projects running, looking at running those parts out to them using some unmanned systems. Things are happening on a much bigger scale. We saw like the Yara Berkeley with the fertilizer, and we just heard about MYK with a, with a car carrier. So the movement of material at different scales is going to be happening in 2025. People. So if you go on and have a little look about a project that was run jointly between MIT and another university, so I can't quote them, looking at um, an automated system for moving people around in Amsterdam. Now, initially you think Amsterdam, quite get that. That's a hard place to do it. There's a lot of there's a lot of traffic, there's a lot of people canoeing, paddle boarding, there's crazy boats at all sorts of angles. Go and find the videos on that project. You'll, you'll be really impressed. Uh, and there's more and more happening things in the Middle East where people are looking at some low emission electric ferries, running pretty short routes but autonomously. <coughs> Go and look at some of the projects in, in Norway and Finland where we've got sort of short automated bridge systems now running unmanned. You're going to see more and more and more of that. Go and type Rolls-Royce, I don't know how you find it, into YouTube, Rolls-Royce automated ferry and watch. You might be there for hours because it will lead you to lots and lots more interesting things. Mining. Infrastructure inspection and maintenance. So BP have been quite open with a goal of theirs to achieve they say 100% or certainly 90% or the lion's share of their underwater asset inspections unmanned by 2025. It's a pretty bold statement for, for an oil company to put out. Aquaculture, security, space travel support, so the, 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 the SpaceX landing budge, what a great example of it. But these are all things that are absolutely happening by 2025. Most of them are already happening today at one level or another. So just the last couple of slides from me on really just a UK focus, so it's on converting this opportunity. Lots of those pioneer early projects were UK focused. Whether they were UK companies or not, doesn't matter, there's a lot of UK people involved in those. We've always been really good at getting in early, being the innovators, being the inventors, We've got to convert that into industry that creates a lot more jobs than it has today. And if I had to put a, I haven't thought about this, I should have been advanced, but there's probably something like four or five hundred people employed in the UK focused on unmanned boats. Why is that not thousands? So ongoing investment in the research is, is just super important from the likes of UK RI. It, it, it doesn't, it, as an industry, it, it, it has been reliant on that and it is still reliant on that for a while. It, it's not standalone. Um, it hasn't got the, the big Silicon Valley bucks coming into it in, in the scale we all love. There's some examples where it's starting to look up sale drum. Um, so, support to encourage investors and businesses to develop in the UK, we need to make it attractive to come here. Um, 
there's work going on, things like the MarLab project that the Department for Transport and MCA are running to try and make data sets that are available um, through the government openly available to developers to use. So whether it's hydrographic models or it's coastal radar or it's AIS history, trying to make it more open for companies to come and test and develop their kit here. The regulatory support, um, there is a positive culture around this. We're not, it's not a blocker, it's not stopping us, but it needs to continue that culture. You know. there's, there's not enough people at the MCA to, to help with this. They are massively under-resourced and um, it really is a team of two. Um, so we need much more sort of commitment from government so that they're going to continue to support that positive culture around regulation. Um, more support of national projects, and I'm not going to steal any of Russ's thunder, but the, the next presentation I'm hoping you might mention it. Things like <coughs> MASMO have just been fantastic, I'm not going to say any more, but more projects where, where the systems get used and on, a, on a sort of national scale. And then, you know, realising this potential around CO2 reductions, HSC exposure reductions and, and increased data. Let's, <coughs> let's make sure those are the points that we really, really focus on. My last slide, um, I don't think you'll be able to read it, I don't expect you to be able to read it, but I just did a quick cant around organisations that are absolutely, definitely active in unmanned surface vessels, autonomous ships, call, call them what you will, um, around the UK. There's a lot. This is, this is pretty dynamic, it's pretty active. If you plotted that 15 years ago, there was, there was about three. Um, I'd love to see what that's going to look like in another two or three years. My, my prediction is, is, is even busier. So it's really exciting industry to work in. Um, it does touch into all the different sectors. I think just about everything that I've seen mentioned today, that there's some link, there's some potential link that doesn't already exist in, into the unmanned surface vessel sort of industry. Um, uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for keeping two times so well. So. We have time for questions, unless the next speaker wants to use that up for speaking. It's a bit extra. Are there any specific questions for them? Okay, it's one. Okay. Ed Steele, Met Office. Um, great presentation as ever, Dan. I was just interested, how much in the uh, autonomous surface sector do you see as development of new stuff versus the opportunity for retrofitting old uh, vessels with autonomous capabilities? Okay, so that's a good question. Um, <coughs> I did a really interesting project with the Canadian Hydrographic Service where they'd commissioned a, a small fleet of conventional manned boats to go and do survey work. Really nice little boats. <coughs> Bought them, operating them, the guys really liked them, they got used to them, but they saw this potential of unmanned systems and what it could do, that they could maybe run 24-7, not get cold, yeah, and stay at home, and, and got involved in a project to sort of retrofit those and, and make them unmanned, so now they can run manned or unmanned. The Royal Navy has got loads and loads of, they call them 24-foot sea boats, the Pacific 24, they've got loads of those, they're not about to suddenly change all that over. There is a project ongoing to start retrofitting unmanned capability to that. Now, back in the sort of pioneer phase, you know, the, the control box, even for a small boat, was about as big as this lectern, and the radio <coughs> comms box was about as big as this. And with, with investment, as more and more systems have been built, we've, we've inve invested in sort of embedded hardware, and, and now the control boxes are down to this sort of size. So yeah, I, I hope that can happen. I think it'd be. There's a couple of um, inland waterways projects running in, in, sort of in Europe where there's massive investment already in all of these barges. You know, if we're trying to be sustainable as an industry, bidding those and sort of building brand new shiny fancy unmanned ones doesn't seem the right way to go. So there's quite a lot of work looking at how they can be retrofitted with, with remote actuation and control. So yeah, I, I hope that kind of side of it grows and there's a few companies that have set up now um, sea Machines is a good one to quote, the US company that has started small and they're, they're building up and their model has been very much that really to retrofit their kit to other existing vessels. I think you'll see a few more of those. I hope we see a few more of those. Um, thanks. Okay, I, I suggest we move on to the next speaker, so thanks again, Dan. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.